Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. Uh, it's been a while since our next guest was on the show. Uh, we have a lot of time for him. Check out his website, abledanger.net. That's A-B-E-L danger, uh, dot net. One of the most experienced pilots alive as a naval aviator and commercial pilot for over five decades. I think his experience is pretty much unparalleled. We learned all about him some years ago when he blew the whistle on the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot, added to planes and deployed without the knowledge of pilots. Staggering stuff. He believes, does our next guest, that it has been responsible for many accidents and many accidents on purpose, for want of a better way of putting it. Tonight, though, he's going to talk about a few different things. Corruption endemic in US politics. We'll talk about Donald Trump on September the 11th. A little bit of Hillary Clinton thrown in as well. Let's welcome back to the programme our friend Field McConnell. Field, welcome back. How are you? I'm very fine and I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, How can you hear me? Are you hearing me well, Richie? We're getting you loud and clear. It's almost like you're in the room. Great stuff. Listen, tell me this. I've been inundated by people asking me to congratulate you on getting married. Did you get married again recently? Uh, Yes, and this time I married a British woman whose name was Denise Irene Clark. Now it's Denise Irene McConnell. And I'm confident that you and uh, she will meet someday, uh, someplace in England. Well, I Uh, hope so, and sincere congratulations to both of you. I didn't know that. Um, I'm thrilled for you, and um, um, may the road rise with you, as we say in Ireland. Gunairi and Boherlat, or live, I should say. Gunairi and Boher live. Uh, congratulations, mate. A lot of people saying that on social media, so great stuff. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And uh, I've, I've mentioned that she's a Brit. Actually, her uh, genetics are from Ireland, but Northern Ireland. But, you know, we're all the common people around the world. We don't pick where we're born. We just pick who we serve and what we do. Absolutely right. Now, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. When, yeah. when I announced you were coming on today, one of our listeners said... Richie, you've had Field on um, several times before. It's always been brilliant and it's always been fascinating. But you've never mentioned to Field or asked for his take on geoengineering programs, planes being modified to spray uh, chemtrails and chemicals in our atmosphere. And it's actually true. I've never put that to you. What do you make of that, Field? What's your whole take on geoengineering? Well, I just happen to know a man... um in Vancouver, who I believe is one of the experts in the world on that. His name is Tim White, uh, and I can put you in touch with him, I believe, by via email. I am very much aware of the uh, geoengineering uh, and the chemtrail uh, thoughts and uh, facts, and I know that there's a lot of people around the world that are very, very frightened, uh, if not terrified, of what the potential of this is, and uh, I do not I only have 24 hours a day and I'm using 27 of them. So I'm not well-schooled or well-versed on uh, chemtrails. Uh, My wife, Denise, who's four feet from me to the right right now, uh, she has a great interest in that. But since you're asking me the question, I'll just give you the only honest answer I can that I'm, uh, it's not that I deny it or embrace it. It's just, uh, I'm so busy with what I have been doing for 10 years uh, that I have not, taken the time to come up to speed on chemtrails, but I'll throw you a curve. What's your feeling, Richie? Well, when I, you know, I, I come from a commercial radio mainstream uh, media background, and there would have been a time when I thought anybody talking about geoengineering and chemtrails, I would have thought they were for the nut house, you know, get a straight jacket quick and, and lock them up. But um, I've seen a lot field. I've, you know, been close to some great researchers who provided some terrific evidence. And yeah, I do believe that there is a multi-purpose geoengineering program going on worldwide to achieve a lot of different things. And um, it, it is terrifying, as you said. And um, good to know that Denise is interested in it. We might chat about that at some time uh, in the future. But I totally understand your time is taken up with um, with other matters. But you, of course, having all that experience as a pilot, you know, some of our listeners were interested in your in your take on it. When you hear Donald Trump talk about September the 11th uh, field and he gives, you know, these cryptic uh, comments at times about bombs and about finding out what really happened, do you believe him? 
do you believe he's genuinely interested in getting to the bottom of what really happened? That's a very good question, and I think he alone and his inner circle could answer that. Uh, I, I'm trying to give him credit of the, uh, de- excuse me, uh, whatever that expression is, benefit of the doubt. Uh, here's why. Uh, immediately after the attack of 9-11, he was uh, interviewed, uh, and it's available on YouTube, and I published the interview in the last 24 hours, and he said that as someone who's erected steel skyscrapers, uh, and this is his response back in 2001, 15 years ago, he said he did not believe that what was reported by the mainstream media was even possible, and at that time, 15 years ago, he believed there had to be some explosive devices uh, in the buildings, and uh, if I'm quoting him correctly, that he's demonstrating 15 years ago that he was on the right track and he was not buying the mainstream uh, media garbage, which is impossible. Uh, In the history of steel frame skyscrapers, uh, none have ever burned to the ground except for those that uh, came down on the morning of 9-11. And uh, there's a a cliche, follow the money. And uh, the Rockefeller family had an occupancy problem in World Trade 1 and 2, uh, and that was because of asbestos. And so to uh, cut their losses, they had hoped to be able to demolish the buildings, but because the buildings were too high, the uh, height of those two buildings before they came down was 1,362 feet and 1,368 feet. And because of that extreme height, uh, the Port Authority of New Jersey, I believe it was, denied them permission to bring them down. Okay, so uh, am am I accusing the Rockefeller family of knocking them down? Yes, I am. Uh, Did they do it alone? No, they didn't. Uh, Did they use airplanes? Yes, they did. What was the purpose of the airplanes? And that's just eye candy. It was a visual visual, demonstration of something that could not bring a building down. And why do I say that, Richie? I say it because jet fuel, which is similar to kerosene, if it's uh, burned in the proper or the perfect mix with air, can only generate about 1,200 degrees Celsius. The steel in World Trade 1, 2, and 7, and 6, I believe, uh, was contracted to be steel that was capable of withstanding 2,000 degree heat. It's my understanding the steel that was delivered was capable of 2,800 degree heat. So what I'm saying, Richie, it's academically impossible. It cannot be proven to be possible by Serco, by Rockefeller, the Clinton Foundation, or anybody else who wants to come along. So once you realize the official narrative is impossible, that really opens the uh, conversation or the narrative, well, then what is possible? And I do believe Donald Trump is absolutely right. I believe pre-placed explosives were part of it. I believe it was a three-pronged attack where the aircraft were only visual eye candy, and they they could not have possibly brought the towers down. Over to you, Reggie. And you, you believe, don't you, just to stay on this just for a minute, you believe that the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot was definitely deployed on that day. Yes. And I don't know if you've been following my emails because I know you're busy and I know I'm busy, but I've, uh, I'm aware of a patent uh, that I haven't published before, but just to make sure that the people that are perpetrators of 9-11 and 15 other aviation accidents, which were not accidents, to quote you, uh, and I've listed those aviation accidents and I've given them a name, Baker's Dozen. Okay, in, over here on this side of the ocean, Baker's Dozen means 13. In other words, if you buy a dozen donuts, they might as a courtesy give you a... Yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, we're on the same page. Uh, there's been 13... Uh, well, when I came up with the term Baker's Dozen, there had been 13 uh, hits with a BUAP after 9-11. Now they're up to 15. And, uh, you know, it's very easy. Like when you were in mainstream media, if I told you that I knew how Malaysia 370 was taken uh, on the morning of the 8th of March of 2014, you as a mainstream uh, source would probably think I was nuts. However, the facts are these, and they're not recent. They're mature. Uh, On the 8th of March of 2014, Malaysia 370 was taken in exactly the same manner as the aircraft were taken on 9-11. 
there's 14 other post 9-11 remote controlling of aircraft. But uh, I was called and I was, I believe I'm the only person that was called to Malaysia to explain to them uh, the remote capture of Malaysia Flight 370. And I went there, but the only reason why they invited me was because on the very day it went down, uh, our organization, Able Danger, and I heard you graciously announce that we are abeldanger.net, but we are also abeldanger.org. Uh, our organization published a YouTube, uh, which the title is, it's easy to remember, it's Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. There's probably 20 to 30,000 views of that. It's six minutes long, and it's uh, accurate enough and lethal enough to where uh, the government and the airline in Malaysia wanted me to go down there and explain it to them, which I did. Uh, I traveled to Kuala Lumpur from Minneapolis. I left here on the 15th of April of 2014, stopped in Amsterdam, got on board Malaysia MH17. Does that name ring a bell, Richie? Oh, it does, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, you say of course, and I say of course. But for our listeners, of course, we should always we shouldn't assume knowledge. We should always tell them exactly what happened. Yeah, we're talking over Ukraine, right? Yes, and and uh, well, I I'll, I'll try to stay on the the historic chronological truth. Uh, Malaysia asked me to please come to Malaysia and explain it to them. I went there, I explained it to them, <clears throat> but for whatever motivation, and it wasn't intentional on my part, but I told them in writing on the 29th of March, between when they asked me to come and when I went, I said, I'm going to come and tell you exactly happened, what exactly what happened to Malaysia 370, but if you do not share it with the world, then you should look forward to a second explosive event no later than 7 p.m. on the 17th of July. Well, there's people that saw my prediction, and then on the 17th of July, they saw Malaysia 17 come down, and they think I have insider knowledge or that I'm prescient <clears throat> or that I can see the future. I'm none of those things, but I can see the past, and because, and this sounds boastful, I don't mean it that way, but because of the nature of my professional career, which was flying airliners uh, from Monday to Friday and flying uh, air defense interceptors, fighter pilots, fighter jets, excuse me, on weekends, uh, I was in a position to fully understand what happened on 9-11. Um, what happened on 9-11 was repeated on Adam Air 574 on the 1st of January of 2007. It was repeated uh, on the 5th of May of 2007 with Kenya Air uh, 507. I don't know if I said Adam Air 507, it's Adam yeah, Air Yeah, Fox. yeah, yeah. These, yeah. Partic uh, these, these particular yeah. incidences, all of these ones that you've listed, these um, Baker's dozen, as we call them, when, uh, when when you looked into every one of them, field th obviously, what did it, what do what what's the Latin phrase again? Qui bono, who benefits? So these planes were brought down specifically because there was somebody on board that needed to be eliminated, right? Not just that; there were other reasons as well. But generally, let's get rid of somebody on board who we want to get rid of. Yes. And I, I've got a very specific example, and it's Colgan Flight 3407. That's spelled C-O-L-G-A-N. There was a woman on that flight <clears throat> whose name was Beverly Eckert. She was the widow of Sean Rooney. And Sean Rooney was killed in the uh, attack of 9-11, and she was a member of the 9-11 survivors group. She had gone to the White House and talked to uh, the person who claims his name is Barack Obama, and she asked Obama, she apparently was frustrated with George W. Bush, and she went there representing the survivors group and said, uh, President Obama, would you help us get to the truth of 9-11? Uh, she died the next day. Uh, she was a passenger aboard Colgan Flight 3407. The day was, after, Field, the day after she met with the president, she went down and she had pressed upon his, well, if he has a human side, uh, his paternal nature, she pressed upon him, listen, you really got to reopen the investigation into 9-11. And the following day, she went down in the plane crash. Yes, and there's nothing, I mean, uh, it's. I don't want to get overly spiritual, but, you know, she's a creation of God. And, and uh, 
there, but there's nothing special about her. No, she's no more special than me or you, Richie, or Denise here to my side. Uh, we're all special, uh, but they killed her. And the reason they needed her dead was she was uh, picking a scab. They thought it healed, but the scab will never heal. The attack of 9-11 was not simply against the United States of America. It was against the world global commoners. It was against decency. And it was, a, it was against uh, what I would characterize as the creator's wishes. Uh, but each and every one of those uh, accidents, which were not accidents, had the same signature. Uh, the sign just to make this fairly brief, um, the signature is remote control of the aircraft after the crew on board loses control of the aircraft, which is immediately followed by a lack of radio contact and also immediately followed by a lack of ACARS, A-C-A-R-S, Automated Crew Activity Reporting System. When the BUAP is triggered remotely, it automatically shuts down the communication devices aboard the targeted aircraft. Uh, well, <clears throat> I, anybody in my position, it's nothing special about me, but anybody with my background that saw this same thing occurring one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Uh, we didn't count to 19. We're, we're up to 19. But uh, at some point, you figure out what they're doing because they're using the same modus operandi. And uh, the people that did 9-11, you ask cui bono. And what that means, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'll take a break and let you correct me. But doesn't that mean who benefits? Yeah, it does, yeah. Okay, here's who benefits. Uh, the corporations posing as governments of the United States, of the United Kingdom, of Israel, though that's my opinion, not yours. Uh, but I agree with you. Don't worry about that. You can say what you want. I agree with you. Go ahead. Well, thank you. And God bless you, Richie, for having the nerve to say that. I almost said another word for nerve. That's a little <laughs> more, yeah, there you go. You know cojones. Cojones is a good word. Cojones. Yeah, that's Spanish. Cojones. You have to have some cojones. And uh, your question to me about uh, who benefits, qui bono, follow the money. The corporations benefit. The United States of America is not a free and sovereign nation. It's a corporation uh, partially controlled right out of your neighborhood, the crown agents in the city of London. And yet a lot of people in England don't understand that the city of London is sovereign territory. Right. And even your monarch can't go in there without permission. And if she does go in there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't she have to remove her tiara? That's right. All of that is true. You're, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at the depth of your knowledge and the research. I'm not surprised at it, uh, but I'm thrilled at it. You're absolutely right, of course. And the vast majority of people in the United Kingdom wouldn't have any idea uh, about any of this. Our listeners are expressing horror at the reality that an elite... Um, band of criminals will take a plane out of the sky if it suits them because they want to kill one or two people on the plane. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I probably will be wrong, but when we first spoke about MH370 uh, uh, field, wasn't there a belief that there were some gentlemen on that plane with a scientific patent worth potentially, if not hundreds of millions, billions of dollars? Is that right? You're absolutely right. Those gentlemen, and I don't think there were any ladies, but there could have been some females. I don't believe so. There were 20 employees. The name of the corporation is Freescale Technologies. They're located in Austin, Texas, here in the colonies. Uh, the ethnic mix of the 20 employees that were targeted uh, were 8 and 12. And I can't remember if it was 8 Malaysians and 12 Chinese or the reciprocal. But there were eight of one group and 12 of the other. And the patent owners of uh, the technology that these experts had created, uh, they shared the ownership of that patent with one of the Rothschilds. And I can picture him, his wife, I believe. No, that's not right. Anyway, uh, it's the elder. He's older than I am. I'm 66. The Rothschild I'm talking about is the guy who's calling the shots. But what happened was the nature of the ownership of the patent of Freescale Technologies, the nature was that the ownership would be shared with the 20, or some of the 20 individuals, I think four of the 20 owned the patent, 
and they shared it with Rock, uh, Rothschild. I'm not sure if it's Jacob. We'll find out. Evelyn. It might be Evelyn the Rothschild, no? Yeah, Evelyn, that's it. What's his wife's name? Evelyn the Rothschild. You've caught yeah. me on the hop there now. Oh, I, her I name her name is Lynn the Rothschild. Lynn Forrester, is it? Lynn, yes, yes. Lynn Forrester. I think it might be Lynn Forrester the Rothschild, yeah. Yeah, yeah third or fourth or right. fifth wife. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, well, the, the uh, protocol was that these four Freescale employees who were among the 20, and uh, Evelyn, did you say Evelyn? Denise, Evelyn the Rothschild? Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, the, the Rothschild shared the ownership, but if the on the date which uh, Malaysia 370 went down, which was the 8th of March of 2014, the patent had not been awarded yet, and the protocol was it would be shared by anybody who was alive the day it was awarded. So uh, everybody else except the Rothschild with their name on the patent was dead. Now, somebody might say, quo bono? Uh, quo bono. Yeah, quo well, bono, yeah, who benefits? Well, obviously, it was Evelyn de Rothschild. Yes, I'm glad you see it the way I see it. Uh, and going back to who benefits, uh, there are certain elements over there in your country, and I'm, I, I, I wouldn't be married to an English lady if I didn't love England. And I do love England. I was just there last week on Hailing Island. Uh, but I... You know, you can't run from who owns HSBC and you can't run from who owns Serco. <clears throat> Serco controls the United States of America, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, Serco has a very big signature in the Baker's Dozens in, in Malaysia 370 and Malaysia 17. And uh, I'll give you something you can really be the first radio show host in the world to hear out of my mouth. But the patent that I'm not revealing, I... I'll reveal it to you if I ever come over to England and meet you before it's public. But there is the possibility of a $7 trillion qui tam lawsuit. Qui tam means uh, someone who brings a case that uh, benefits the king or the government. And part of the qui tam protocol is the relator, which means the person, in this case it'd be me, uh, the person that's relating how a specific patent applies to a crime that has negatively impact, impacted a, corp, a company, uh, that person, in this case me, I cannot be specific about what the patent really is, the number of it, the identity. So I've come up, uh, and I think I sent you an email about this, Richie. But yeah, I, yeah the, the identifier is all capital letters, B-U-G-S, BUGS, capital S-01, capital E-03. And I told you that I would explain what that means. And uh, so I'm not trying to embarrass you because nobody... Not at all. Me. No, this is good stuff. But bear in mind that the listeners haven't seen the email chain that I've seen. So break it down as simply as you possibly can what this is about. Well, in 1995, British Broadcasting Corporation had a TV show. Uh, the name of the TV show was Bugs. Uh, on the first, uh, the first year of the... TV show that was season one was 1995. Uh, episode number three was called All Under Control. Uh, what that was about, that's the first public demonstration of the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot that I'm aware of. But it was not the first use of the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot. Airbus Industries started putting them in Airbus 320 aircraft in 1989. Now, I'm not a mathematician or a historian, but both 1989 and 1995 were before 9-11. So whatever possessed BBC to demonstrate their foreknowledge of the upcoming attack, which is characterized by history as the second Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a political think tank in the United States, I think it was called PNAC, uh, for New American Century, and they thought in order to usher in the new world that we had to have a second Pearl Harbor. Well, uh, I've written three books uh, in the last four months. I don't know if you know that. The name of the books are Gadget Vent, Follow BVR. BVR stands for Beyond Visual Range. That means somebody's killing you that you can't see. 
And the third book is Lemon Squeeze, which means a lot to you people in the UK and people in America have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yeah, because, you know, it, it's sort of humorous at this point, because all these atrocities against humanity, uh, they're all done in such a haphazard manner uh, that people like Richie Allen, Field McConnell, David Hawkins, and a whole host of people aren't buying this baloney. I went over... Uh, can I just interrupt you briefly there? Because that's a brilliant yeah, point. It's a brilliant point you're raising there. And we, I noticed on abledanger.net, folks, go to able, A-B-E-L, danger.net. It's a terrific website. It's where you'll find out all you need to know about field, all of these investigations, all the info is there. And on the on the homepage today, there's um, th- there's a bit about the, the man, uh, Ahmed Khan Rahami, the man who's supposed to have, you know, committed the the bombing in New York last weekend, and he also set off bombs in New Jersey. Now, the story of this guy, again, as you said earlier on about the similarities amongst these stories, it's ridiculous, the, you know, the the, the backstory about this guy going to Afghanistan, being radicalised, then he comes back, he plants these bombs, he gets drunk and he falls asleep in a doorway and then he gets caught, and it's just complete nonsense. Why... Uh, why do they make so many mistakes, Field, when they carry out these false flag operations? Is it because they are certain that even if Field McConnell, even if David Icke, even if Jim Mars and others, even if they see through it, it doesn't matter because the wider public are so asleep, they're so comatose, it won't matter. We can be sloppy if we want to be. What say you to that? Well, I, I agree with everything you just said. And that's why, you know, every time I hear an American or a Brit or a French person or a Russian or a South African lament the fact that the global population is asleep and they say people have to wake up, uh, I take a different tack, Richie. I don't think we can wake up the global population, but I think we can intimidate the very small number of perpetrators. Uh, The perpetrators have several things in common. Uh, First and foremost, they're all collectively a bunch of cowards. Secondly, they are, in fact, serving Satan. Whether they're aware of that or not, that doesn't matter. They're serving Satan. And I hope you don't think that I'm hard-nosed about this, but a lot of the people in your government for the last 40 years and, well, 50 years, Ted Heath, uh, going back 50 years at least, A lot of people in the United Kingdom and the United States at the top of our power structures are pedophiles. And uh, have you ever heard the term Operation U-Tree? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Denise and I were at a pub in Hayling Island called the U-Tree. And on 9-11, right across from all the carnage, there was one tree that survived the attack of 9-11. You want to take a guess as to what type of tree that was, Richie? It was a U. A Y-E-W, was it? How incredible. Well, what I'm saying, and, you know, I don't claim, I'm just a common person, and I would love nothing more than to go over to Ireland tonight and listen to Van Morrison sing Washing Windows or Cleaning Windows. Uh, There's some brilliant, brilliant people out there that know the truth, and they express it in a lot of different ways. Van Morrison is one of those people. Uh, You've got a very high profile guy over there named Richard Branson, who knows my name and whether, do I like him? Of course I don't, I've never met him. Do I dislike him? Of course I don't, that's negative. But he knows my name and he respects what I do and I know his name and I respect what he's done. And now it is uh, 10 years after I first communicated with him when he was starting his airline in America called Virgin America, he had a contest for people around the world to name the airliners. And I said, uh, Sir Richard, why don't you name one of them Queen of the Slipstream? And I went on in an email to say that was a Van Morrison song, which is beautiful. His, his email response to me was, Field, that song was recorded in my manor house. Wow. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is, Even when people don't recognize God, and I'm not saying he does or doesn't, I'm just saying I don't know, but God is in control, not Satan. Satan tried to control the world once before, 
uh, and he was kicked out. And I think we're approaching the time where he needs to be kicked out once and for all. Uh, and You're right we- to mention him, by the way. I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy for you to bring him up because we know from evidence that we've uncovered, you mentioned Ted Heath, we know that Satanism and Satanic worship is um, it's endemic. To use that word again, it's endemic uh, amongst the elites and the power brokers. We know this. I just want to ask you again about the Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. You blew the whistle on this, and despite everything else you've done, you're always going to be remembered for that as much as anything else. How many commercial airline pilots field do you believe in 2016 are aware their plane is fitted with that piece of equipment? I I would say a super minority, but of all, 100% of the people that are aware of it, they can take a look at me and anyone who, well, here's, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm sitting four feet from Denise. The only reason Denise and I met is she had an intense interest in Malaysia 370 and how it was taken. So she Googled around. She heard about the Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. She heard about me. She knew I was coming to Telford to speak about it. She knew I'd be coming into Heathrow, and she and two gentlemen from England, uh, they all three volunteered to pick me up at Heathrow and drive me to Telford. I don't know about you, but I think most of us males would rather drive for two hours with a female than a male, (laughs) and that was my mindset. So God bless her for having the nerve to even talk to me or get in the same car. But uh, the... uh, the Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot, if anybody working for uh, Virgin or Air France or KLM or uh, Lufthansa, and Lufthansa is really critical here because they strip the Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilots out, and their defense uh, guy, whose name escapes me right now, oh, Von Bulow, he, um, he exposed this years ago, but when they got their brand new 747-400s, the German technician, they're called techniques over there, but it's uh, the aviation avionics technicians. They found that autopilot and they ripped it out and uh, they were not happy with Boeing because it cost them $800 million to, to rip repair. out the Boeing part and replace it with a Lufthansa German part. Uh, but see, that's where uh, another layer of an onion skin exists. The Boeing uninterruptible autopilot is not a Boeing device. It was made by General Electric and General Electric The CEO of that corporation has the highest company paid life insurance of any CEO in North America. And it's my opinion, speaking as a uh, individual, Field McConnell, it's my opinion the reason his insurance is so high is because General Electric's signature on 9-11 is as broad as anybody's uh, with the exception of maybe Serco and I'm going to think of one more here. Um, oh, yes, Wells Fargo. Uh, Wells Fargo had foreknowledge. Circo had foreknowledge. Well, um, we, know, we know all about the insider trading, don't we, which was covered by, amazingly enough, by Rolling Stone magazine uh, at the time, but they didn't get too far. Ultimately, I think they were told by on high that, oh, we can't figure out where all the trading went. So it must have been Osama in his cave in Afghanistan. And of course, people bought that. Did you say to me a year or so ago, now if I'm misquoting you, I apologize. I I probably am wrong. But did you say to me that if a pilot knows, if he or she knows their plane is equipped with the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot, they are breaking the law by getting on that plane and taking off. Did you say that to me before? I think you might have done. Well, you're absolutely right, uh, Richie. And what I told you last time we spoke about this, that in the United States of America, any airline captain who knowingly puts his aircraft into operation, if he has any concerns about the safety of the aircraft and the safety of the crew and cargo, is illegal to put the aircraft into operation. The name of that regulation, I'm going to speak as slowly and as clearly. I'll even try to do an Irish accent. It's, <laughs> yes, I have to hear this. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't really do an Irish accent unless you give me six Guinnesses, which reminds me, if you give me three, I'll give you three and we'll be even. But, Sounds good. Uh, the regulation in the United States of America is Foxtrot Alpha Romeo, F-A-R, 121.533, 
And basically that regulation, which any of your listeners can, can Google it, FAR 121.533, it says the captain of an airliner registered in the U.S. is in violation of the law if he, he or she knowingly puts it into operation uh, if he has any or she has any concerns about the safety of the aircraft. Okay, so once again, we have way too many attorneys and not enough clear thinkers. What does into operation mean? Does it mean take off? Does it mean push back from the gate? No, it means this legally. It means if you start reading the start checklist, right then the aircraft's in operation. The minute you, when the captain calls for the first officer to give me the start checklist, if as soon as that's on the voice recorder, the security people can come on board the airliner and put a uh, uh, that device that monitors alcohol. If you even say, give me the start checklist and you're under the influence of alcohol, you're in violation of flying drunk. Same thing, uh, if you call for the checklist and you think that there's a possibility that you have the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot installed, you're in violation of that regulation. So Richie, whether you're a Brit, a Russian, a Kiwi, an Aussie, a uh, Japanese or Malaysian, if you know, if you tell anybody you know about the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot and you operate the aircraft, you're in jeopardy of losing your job, of losing maybe some, well, certainly a portion of your retirement. And unfortunately for most of these pilots around the world, uh, they're so hung up on prestige and their appearance and smoke and mirrors that they'll go ahead and operate aircraft uh, in winning violation of the regulation. But if they're clever and they want to protect their phony baloney jobs, they'll never admit to anybody that they've heard of the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot. An image, but, um, sorry, sorry, for you, an image is coming across my um, mind as you're speaking. I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, because of your profile, there are men and women working as commercial pilots today. They will know all about you. Not every pilot in the world, but a percentage of them will know about you. Some of them will. And they will know through you about the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot. But they have to make a living. I have this mental image field of men and women taking control of planes and looking very, very closely at the passenger manifest. Who the hell is on this plane that I'm going to fly today from Charlotte, North Carolina to JFK Airport? Because if there's somebody on that plane that might be a big player in politics, might be a captain of industry, might have pissed somebody off, maybe I don't want to fly this plane today. You know, this is the reality of it, isn't it? It is, and I'm really glad you used the term piss them off because... Earlier, when I said, you said cojones, and I said nerve, we were both thinking of something else. Uh, do you ever heard of the politician in England called Ed Balls? We have, of course, I yes. Know, I don't know where his name <laughs> popped into my mind, but yeah, you just said Charlotte to New York City. Now, did you randomly pick Charlotte? Or yeah, just, a, just just picked it out off the top of my head, yeah. Well, that's funny, because there was a uh, Black Lives Matter uprising in Charlotte yesterday. Well, that's where and, I'm getting it from then, of course. Yes, it's and in it the was news, sponsored yeah. by George Soros and Hillary Clinton. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. And I, I've already sent Donald Trump and his attorney and a certain member of his family that's a male. I've sent them the link to your show, and I told them I'm going to come in here and I'm going to give them the opportunity, because they like money. Uh, you know, I... Do I like money? No, I hate it. It's never been my friend. And it's been a tool where bad people... I just got ripped off by a corporation uh, Thursday of the 15th of September. A week ago today, I had a major insurance company uh, knowingly defraud me and steal $38,117.14 uh, $38, out of an account and of course, they, they claim ignorance and stuff. Well, they can't claim that because I explained to them exactly uh, what they're in violation of. And, you know, I'm not afraid to name names. Uh, the name of the corporation is United Services Automobile Association. I've been a member there for 47 years, going back to 1969. And uh, my account number, I think, let me think about that. Uh, I guess I can't remember it right now. But because um, it's too close to my Marine Corps number. 
But my account at USAA was robbed in a racketeer, racketeering and corrupt organization fraud across state lines involving the state of Wisconsin, where I live, uh, National Financial Services in New Jersey, and United Services USAA in San Antonio, Texas. And I've advised all three of these people that if you're trying to steal things from me, you're picking on the wrong guy because I know exactly where the fraud occurred. But let's not go down that road. Let's go down this road. Uh, Hillary Clinton is so terrified of not being the first woman ever to be the CEO of the corporation of the United States of America that she and her sponsor, George Soros, will stop at nothing. Uh, I sent you a link right before the show that came in right before the show, and it has a picture of Hillary and uh, Trump and both of them burning. Well, one of them, if either one of them are serving Satan, and trying to destroy the United States of America and innocent people anywhere, whether they're in Syria or Oman or Ethiopia or Sierra Leone or Pakistan, uh, what they need to know, and I'm speaking from biblical history that's never been proven wrong, is they're gonna burn in hell. And uh, I would like to prevent Hillary from burning in hell, but it's not because I'm magnanimous it's because I want to see her swing from a rope because she's committed treason. And guess what, Richie? My own sister, I'll say it very calmly, Christine Marcy. Who, whom you've mentioned I, before, yeah, on the program, I remember, yeah. yeah. Well, my sister is the woman who gave Hillary Clinton the intellectual property, which turned into the attack of 9-11. And Hillary Clinton knows my name. The guy posing as Obama, whose real name, is Barry Swatero, S-O-E-T-O-R-O. -E he and I went to the same high school in Honolulu, Hawaii. It's the most prestigious high school in the United States of America. It's named Punahou, P-U-N-A-H-O-U. -U. I was registered as Field McConnell Christian United States. Two of those three were correct. I am Field McConnell, and I my citizenship on earth is in the United States. Was I a Christian then? No, I wasn't, but that's what they put down. Uh, when he was registered, he was registered as Barry Swatero, Indonesian Muslim. Was that accurate? Yes, it was accurate. It was accurate then and it's accurate today. Richie, over to you. Do you believe, you know, l lately on the program, we've had two or three very credible people talking about monarch mind control. Now, I know you know a lot about this. Do you, yes. be, do you believe that um, Barack Obama, and as some of our listeners are going to find this so fantastic, they will not buy it at all, but do you believe that a guy like him is chosen as a kid? He's mind controlled, he's, he's damaged in the way that they damage children, and then they use him, uh, and that he, ultimately he moved from <laughs> his time as you know a high school student, he ended up as a CIA asset, working for the CIA, and, and then moved into politics and all of that. Do you buy that as a possible theory? I buy it 100%, Richie. Uh, when he was at Punahou School, uh, as a preteen, he wrote his name in wet cement at the corner of Punahou Street and another avenue I can't remember, but the address of the corner is 1601 Punahou Street, Honolulu, Hawaii. And in the wet, in the wet cement, he with his finger, I don't know if he's right-handed or left-handed, but I've got a finger for him, uh, you think he's left-handed? Okay, Denise says he's left-handed. With his left index finger, if Denise is correct, he wrote King Obama, K-I-N-G Obama. Now that establishes somebody put the idea in his head when he was a preteen that someday he would be trying to run the world. I'm going to turn this over to you. I just heard a rumor yesterday that his name is being considered to be uh, the director or the chairman of the United Nations. Am I correct? Or do you know, Richie? I didn't hear that, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I'm sure they have plans for, you know, the public life position that he will hold when he leaves office. He's not going anywhere, Field. Uh, he, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he doesn't have... You're thinking mm -hmm. that he might be in line to eventually become the general secretary of the United Nations at some stage. Didn't hear yeah. that, but it wouldn't surprise... I don't know if it's possible, but if it is possible, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I know, and I'm not, I'm not expressing knowledge that that is the case. I'm just telling you, honestly, I heard that yesterday for the first time, 
Uh, and if you might allow me to get back to that patent, the bugs, SO1 EO3, uh, the reason I use that number is the BBC television show called All Under Control, where BBC, Circo, HSBC, and I'm not sure if Circo was around then or if they, they changed their names a lot. At one point, they were RCA Great Britain. Then they became, well, they started out as one thing, they became another, I think Marconi, RCA Great Britain, and then Circo. But even though they changed their name, they don't change their modus operandi. They've been destroying things since uh, the Whitechapel murders in 1888, uh, the Titanic going down, I think it was in 1912, and 9-11. And these, I, I almost feel sorry for Rupert Nicholas Soames and David Cameron and Theresa May uh, because they have been groomed and they've been, and Obama, they've been groomed by their parents and their handlers. Don't worry, we've got it all under control. You just do what we tell you and we'll give you everything you want, everything from perverted sex, like pedophile sex. Uh, let's see, Joe Biden, the vice president of the U.S., was caught on tape telling a 15 now well, now i tell you what i'm going to do you and i we don't often disagree i'm going to argue with you there i've seen that clip of biden speaking to that young girl and i think her parents are standing behind him i i'm going to give it to a friend of mine who's an audio specialist i think that somebody making mischief might have enhanced that to make it sound like biden is saying that i can't believe biden would be as stupid as that uh, field i really can't that's just my take on it. I'm not trying to defend him now. If he did say it, he's a sick bastard and he needs to be dealt with. But I'm not sure that we're, we, we can yet be 100% sure that he did say that. I agree. And let me show you how much I agree. On 9-11, there was voice splicing technology deployed where a guy whose name may come to me, yeah, just did, Todd Beamer. Uh, he was aboard United 93. He allegedly called his mother on a cell phone and said, Mom, this is Todd Beamer. Okay, who calls their mom and says, Mom, this is Todd Beamer? Your mom knows your first name. She knows your voice. Yeah. Uh, that was all voice splicing. And so I agree with you 100%. I wonder uh, about that, Phil, just, just in case our listeners don't know what we're talking about. Um, he was pictured, he was, he was filmed meeting people, I think, at, at the White House. Maybe it was in um, one, one of the Senate buildings. I can't remember where. She's 13. Her parents are there as well. And a, a video appears to show him telling her that he's horny. Do you want to know how horny I am? It appears that he's saying that. Now, Field, if you were standing behind a man and he said that to your daughter... I think we'd have to scrape Field McConnell off the guy. Uh, you'd hit him so many times. The father doesn't blink and doesn't move. I, I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't want to give these people a pass. But we also, and I know you're the same as me. Um, you're a credible researcher. I'm not a researcher. I'm a broadcaster. You're a researcher. You wouldn't <laughs> say that unless we had absolute proof of it. I, I'd have to have that tape looked at carefully. That's all I'm saying. Well, let's try to do that, but I agree with you 100%. It's entirely possible there's people who would benefit from getting tape where it appears that Joe Biden uh, said that to a girl on a related manner just to show you how sick and depraved the leadership of the United States is. Uh, a guy named Weiner, great name. Uh, I'm so sick of him. He's married to Huma Abedin. Uh, he just had a very specific text message uh, come into the public awareness yesterday or the day before of some very disgusting things that he was, it's called sexting, S-E-X-T-I-N-G. And he was, uh, he was suggesting to a 15, I'm not even going to tell you what he said because it's that offensive. Yes, I have a daughter. I have four daughters. And if you or anyone else ever said something like that to my daughter, you would be incapacitated or I'd be dead. Is absolutely. That, uh, of course, absolutely. That's what you'd expect. And um, the father doesn't blink. It's exactly six minutes to the top of the hour. We've um, sadly got to leave it. That's been the quickest 50 minutes that I remember on the program. 
Um, there's so much more we could have gotten into with Field, but we'll ask him back on the program again uh, as soon as he wants to come back on. His website is abledanger.net, A B E L danger.net. Um, terrific uh, to have you on, Field. It really is. Thanks for, for doing it. I'll give you the final word on it, my friend. We've got about 60 seconds before um, we've got a run, so you have the final word there. Well, I'm going to turn it back to you as soon as I get that one, 30 seconds. abledanger.net or abledanger.org. Uh, my phone number in America is code 001-715-307-8222. My email address is fieldmcc at yahoo.com. I'm a public, transparent, and honest person as much as I can be. And I'll turn it back to you after saying God bless you for having the nerve to have me on, Richie. Hopefully. Not at all. And listen, the best of luck and the best of everything to you and Denise. Uh, I know I can't see Denise there, but she's just to the right of you. Um, I wish you all the, all the luck and all the happiness in the world. And so do our listeners, by the way. You and I will talk again real soon. Thanks for everything you do. Look after yourself, Field. Thank you. Bye-bye. Marvellous Field McConnell on the line to us there from his home.